Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think we will get started. And I hope that still a few people will join us. Um, I expect that that might be the case. Anyway, for those who haven't met me before, I'm Richard Sluzes. I'm from the University of Twente in the Netherlands, and I'm hosting this event, uh, which is part of this Urban Thinkers Campus on Spatial Planning Education and Climate Action. Um, maybe just a, I'll just give a brief introduction to what we're going to do today and, and also a qu very quick recap on what happened last week. Uh, in order to do that, I will just share my screen, if you can bear with me for one second. Um, and I'll just go back to the previous slide. I think you can see it. So last week we started this discussion with a, a, a an opening opening plenary with some inputs from Bruce Stiftel from Georgia uh, Institute of Technology, Schwab Luasa from the Global Center for Adaptation, and, and Andrea Frank from University of Birmingham, talking about knowledge and skills re required by, urban, by spatial planners in doing uh, preparing pl plans for uh, climate action to address issues related to climate change in various contexts. Um, and we talked also about issues related to accreditation and uh, how the plant, different planning communities uh, have different requirements which need to be addressed within planning courses around well, around the world, but looking at a few examples from a number of European cities and also from America. This, this uh, so-called Urban Thinkers Campus consists of actually three activities. So the first activity was last week with the opening session. And then this week we have a number of uh, what we call regional sessions. And the one that we are, we are all part of today is this the one which is organized by the Association of European Schools of Planning. Um, so it's primarily addressing sort of European perspectives on this issue of spatial planning education and climate action. Um, it's the session is, to, is is a little bit long, maybe, but hopefully you will st stay with us. If you do have to leave for whatever reason, of course, just drop out and come back, of course, as soon as possible, so that you can rejoin the conversation. Um, we deliberately intended not to put a break in it, so that to try to maintain uh, our connectivity, you could say, during the process. But the first hour and a half or so, we're going to be talking about uh, a survey which has been instituted by uh, colleagues from the Resi yeah. Resilience and Risks Mitigation Strategies Group of ISOP. Um, and there will be some pres a, a brief presentation about some of the initial findings of that survey. And we will have some reflection from a couple of people who were involved in actual, in the data collection of that. And then we intend to have some uh, a, a more detailed discussion or more detailed look at a couple of planning courses uh, which have um, perhaps been rather innovative in uh, focusing more on climate change issues than, than some others. Both of them are coming from Italy, but that's more a matter of coincidence than uh, of uh, the fact that, that it's not an indication that there's nothing going on anywhere else in, in Europe, of course. And after that, we will have some breakout groups where we would like you to uh, where you can pick and choose a little bit and decide where you want to, what you want to talk about, but where we can maybe involve you in a more interactive way in collecting some of our experiences and ideas for how we can move on in the future. So with that, I would like to, I'll stop sharing my screen um, and go to the program and then open the floor by inviting uh, this presentation, first presentation on the survey findings. So that's coming from Adriana Galderisi, Cassidy Johnson, and, and Amando Karaoka. So we, as uh, Adriana and Richard and I, uh, and other members of the uh, uh, RRMS uh, working group of ASOP. Uh, that works on risk and uh, mitigation strategies, um, decided that we would like to take forward more, um, more proactive approach in looking at what is happening in, 
in education across uh, ASOP member schools looking at uh, climate change. And um, this was coming out of some work that uh, Richard, some engagements Richard had had with uh, UN Habitat and with the uh, planners for climate action. And, um, and yeah, so we took forward this survey um, to try to see in conjunction with uh, other surveys that were being done in US and Canadian schools, as well as in Australian schools, um, to try to understand a bit more about what is being taught in climate change uh, in these planning schools. Um, so we uh, worked with Armando Caroca, who has done all of the uh, sort of, he will present after me and he's done uh, a lot of the analysis of this and helped us set up the survey. Um, and, and we wanted to uh, present this today as, as part of this uh, regional. So the, the idea of doing this survey was to be able to present it here today um, and then to uh, take this forward into, into some uh, publications. So the main research question we had was how are European schools addressing climate change and climate action in their urban and spatial planning courses? Uh, to what extent are they addressing that? Um, as we know, urban planning is recognized as a uh, relevant instrument to address climate change challenges, um, but we have relatively little amount known on a sort of European level context about how much is being taught in European uh, planning schools. Uh, so what we did to do this, um, we had a little bit of funding from uh, the UCL Global Engagement um, Office um, for uh, this collaboration across uh, these European schools. Um, so we've done a, a kind of very light touch approach um, to this. Um, and we did this online data collection. So we had uh, higher education programs. Um, that are members of the um, uh, members of the ASOP uh, directory. So if you look at the at the uh, European uh, Schools of Planning uh, members website, you'll see there are a number of schools that are members of the um, that are me members of the uh, ASOP. And what we did was we wanted to survey these schools. Um, and so we had looked across different ones. We also included Turkey in this um, uh, because there's quite a few planning schools uh, in Turkey. So, and we included European countries um, and we use this sort of online uh, data collection. So based on schools that are uh, schools that are uh, planning schools, and then we put the uh, the data that was just available on their websites, basically. So we asked, uh, looking through the website, so web-based data, web-based data collection, uh, we looked at uh, different keywords. So these are the keywords here you can see on the slide. Um, so I think it's important to understand we haven't gone in uh, particularly in contact at each of the schools, but we were just interested in what information is available. So um, we had very lovely volunteers uh, from the uh, uh, Young Academics Network of ASOP, uh, many of them who were familiar with the different country contexts. Some of them weren't familiar, but some, some of them were familiar with the different schools and country contexts. And what they did was look through the websites uh, to see how much, to see if any of these keywords came up in uh, what was the online information about what's being taught in planning schools. Uh, so we created this EpiCollect uh, survey uh, form. Uh, we recruited the uh, young academics in June uh, and did the, the, they did the data collection uh, in June through September and then we've uh, done a bit of analysis which Armando will present after me and then uh, so today is a, a sort of first report of that uh, and we're very interested to have feedback on this and then we'll complete writing up the report after this. So I'll hand over to Armando. You can just tell me when to advance the, oh, but, well, maybe I'll present this one last slide. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so the, so we wanted to do a second phase, which was a more in-depth review of what is being taught in these programs. Uh, we haven't come to that stage yet. Um, and so it was more just around 
uh, doing this, understanding how what schools, if schools are teaching things on climate change and how much of the programs are about climate change. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, we wanted to bring it together these young academics uh, who are interested in this topic. And so they've helped with the data collection and some of you are here today and hopefully you can give a feedback on this uh, after the presentation. So I'll hand over to Armando now, thank you. Thank you, Cassidy. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. So I'm gonna explain a little bit the, some of the findings we have. Uh, can you return to the previous one, Cassidy? Sorry. Oh, still it's here. The previous one? That one, yeah. So basically, if, um, from June to um, September, we collected through uh, EpiCollect a total of 527 entries uh, done by around 40 surveyors that volunteered and uh, helped us doing this online uh, research. Uh, and that, those, those represented 161 programs. That was the, the, the whole uh, data set. And then we refined it to a total of 143 programs of planning or linked to planning uh, around uh, or across Europe and Turkey. Uh, so the first um, preliminary findings you can see here, for example, we asked uh, the surveyors to indicate the percentage of climate change content uh, per surveyed course. So uh, you can see we had this uh, four, five categories really. And you can see that most of the courses, uh, parts of these uh, programs, uh, most of the courses have a 25 or less percent of climate change content. And, uh, and it, it goes, it goes um, every time uh, reducing this number as you, uh, as you go up until 100. Um, this can also be seen, uh, what we did to compare all the programs was to uh, transform this uh, percentage of climate change into, into a por percentage of the credits per course. Uh, and you can see that um, you have uh, most, most of the, um, most of the courses have uh, 76 to 100 percent of coverage uh, um, equivalent to to credits. But given the fact that uh, there were so uh, few courses per program that were linked to climate change, uh, when you when you do the average, you get to only uh, uh, one point forty six percent of the total credits uh, per program. Uh, is devoted to climate change. So it's less than, yeah, it's 1.5%. So it's really, really low. Uh, next one, Cassidy. Oh, this one. Okay, so here we, after that uh, overall um, percentage, we went through some more specific uh, subsets. Uh, we compared uh, if, there were any, if there was any difference between core versus selective courses. Uh, you can see there that um, the surveyed core courses are pretty much equivalent in number to the elective courses, uh, plus a few more uh, that are from specializations. And then um, if you go to the, oh, here, well, here is also interesting. You can see that uh, 91 programs have climate change content in their core curriculum, which is uh, for us the most important because that means that every student will have at least some content of climate change during the career. And 29 programs have only climate change content on elective courses, which doesn't, of course, guarantee any, any learning from the students if they don't take those, those courses. Next one, Cassidy. Thank you. Um, so then you can see that it's pretty much the same if you compare core courses versus uh, versus uh, elective. Uh, it's again very close to one point. It's lower than 1.5 in 
in all the cases. Uh, uh, next one, Cassidy, please. Here you can see we then went to compare if there was any difference uh, between uh, the content in undergrad, undergraduate programs of planning and graduate programs. And then in that case, we saw a slightly increasing uh, amount of climate change content in the graduate courses, but it's 1.71, as you can see there, versus uh, a bit more than 1% in the undergraduate courses. So it's slightly better for master's level programs, but it's still really, really low on average. Next one, please. Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, then we also had this uh, issue about the, um, because this was all online, and this was one of the difficulties of this study, that uh, not necessarily all the information was available online for all the courses and all the programs. So we, we again, split the, um, the surveys into, into those which uh, uh, where the syllabus was available online compared with the ones who, uh, which uh, doesn't have any syllabus available. And again, you can see there's a, a little difference, slightly better when you don't have the syllabus, which um, we have to analyze what does it mean? I think it doesn't mean that much, but um, if you go to the specific detail of the, of the module, you find even less content on climate change than if you read the, the overall description. So you can see that maybe uh, because the syllabus uh, depicts every session of every course, if you find less content on climate change there, it means that in practice, uh, there's, there's no much going on in those courses, uh, despite the, the title or the description. So that's also something to consider. Uh, next one, please. Uh, here was another inquiry we did to the data set. Uh, we tried to split because we were kind of broad in our definition of what was a planning program. We kind of accepted what the surveyors were offering us. Uh, so not always the program has planning on their names or the title of, of the program. But anyway, we wanted to see if the, the programs with the word planning on them included uh, any more content than others. And in this case, you can see that it's pretty much the same in both cases. Um, so that doesn't really count as a, as a different, as a different. Uh, next one, please. Then we have here a brief list of the countries we surveyed. Uh, we basically had data from all the countries except Croatia and Denmark. Uh, but here I organize the data according to uh, um, to more to less content on climate change. You can see that the Netherlands and Ireland has a, a percentage of average credits on climate change. In the case of Netherlands, 6.6 .6 on the on the right uh, column, uh, on the far right column, 6.6, .6, which is much higher than the average and it's more than double than the second best which is ireland and on the lower end of the of the columns you see such republic and romania who have uh, which have 0.2 uh, and 0.1 percent of content on climate change of course this is still preliminary because for example in the case of romania we only had one program surveyed, so it's difficult to to extract uh, really conclusions for a whole country based on only on what we have. In some cases, we have all the programs surveyed. In other cases, we only have one. So uh, the data has to be really taken carefully. We can say, but we wanted just to to have a an overall view of what was going on in in Europe. Uh, next one, please. So uh, we also had some um, some design limitations that I think are important to mention here. 
uh, first of all, the fact that this was, uh, we took uh, ISOP members as a, as a sample, um, and the fact that the surveyors were vol voluntarily um, voluntarily taking the work, and they also usually were uh, linked to a specific universities where they studied or work. Sometimes you those those can also lead to some biases in the data collection. Like we didn't make, for example, a, a sample, a random sample of schools, which could be also be interesting, or we, we didn't uh, take all the programs. We just take the programs that the surveyors were willing to to review. So um, it again, uh, it can have some kind of, of caveat. Um, and then there are other lessons learned that could be discussed later, maybe about the specificities of the way how the data was collect, uh, collected, about some question that we might have asked and we didn't maybe, so on, so on, but maybe we shouldn't discuss those details now for the moment at least. Uh, uh, so I think I think pretty much that could be a summary of the data we have so far. Uh, so I think I wanna, I'm going to leave it there for the moment. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Amando. Um, I, I suggest that we, we maybe continue by just getting some additional uh, inputs from uh, Massimiliano Granceri and uh, Malia uh, Hashemi because they they were two two of the people who were involved in the data collection and then we can uh, follow that with some discussion about the survey and the results so far. Um, so Massimiliano, I'm not sure. Are you going to make the presentation then? Uh, I will start. Okay. And if people have questions, uh, you can you can pop them in the chat box. Um, but you, I can we can also take them uh, interactively after this presentation. Thanks, Malia. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Malia Hashemi. I participated in this survey for French universities. Ten programs are monitored. I think the Generally, I think the, this initiative to assess climate change causes has been a great experience uh, for me as a young researcher and teacher. I'm here to share my thoughts about the survey on French cases. Um, during the study of the French programs, I noticed two main issues which I would like to share with you. First is about the methodology of investigating on climate change causes. I had a chance to see the results of the survey. They are very interesting and meaningful, but I'm still curious to know how climate change is taught in each course. For example, I would like to know if the course is about the governance or uh, physical geography knowledge in urban planning. We can find a variety of subjects in different French programs. As a young uh, teacher, I would like to know what the applied methods in teaching, what are uh, the applied methods in teaching. Perhaps some qualitative research uh, are needed to know which dimension of climate change is addressed in the course. It was my first point. Uh, that I would like to share with you. Also, during the survey, I noticed that some courses do not mention climate change directly in the title and the syllabus, but you can guess that they do talk about the climate change. For example, the word vulnerability, which is not part of the keyboards of this research, is more used in the French syllabuses instead of words like resiliency or climate change. We can guess when we are talking about the vulnerability, we are talking about the, we can talk about the consequences of the climate change. Uh, 
as a result, some courses are missing from the survey because we cannot find the survey keywords directly in the title and, and, and uh, the syllabus of the course. For example, for uh, sharing my personal experience, I teach a course entitled Integrated Approach to Coastal Management which is given uh, at the Sorbonne University for the first year students in geography and urban planning. In the title and the syllabus, the keywords of the survey are little used. However, climate change is at the heart of the course and many subjects such as the evolution of the sea, sea level are covered uh, in, the, in this course. So uh, there were two points that I would like to share with you. Finally, uh, a bit proposition, proposition or suggestion, it would be useful if we could have a better understanding of each course, perhaps an in-depth interview with each teacher or group discussions with uh, the teachers could provide more reliable results. I know it's very difficult. Um, I think it's finished for me. Uh, thank you, dear organizers, for involving me in such a great survey. And thank you, the audience, for your attention. Now, Massimiliano Granchery will share his reflections on the survey on the Portuguese and Italian cases. Thank you, Malika. Hello, everybody. I am Massimiliano Granciri Bradaschia, today representing uh, two universities, Politecnico di Torino, where I am um, a collector, and uh, U of University of Venice, where I'm a postdoc researcher. Planning education involves engaging students in many wicked contemporary planning problems, of which climate change is a particularly testing example actually is a, also defined as a super wicked problem. Educators are reminded about the importance of some more topical but essential capabilities of required, uh, cap, uh, required of planners in dealing with a range of topical challenging problems. In this case, in this project, I did the survey analyzed some of the Italian and Portuguese cases. In my opinion, the survey helped in snapshotting the current situation of planning curricula, although presenting certain limitations. For instance, keywords may be improved due to a lack of a specificity in some theme. And uh, of course, we did a survey online desk-based and we couldn't involve a direct interaction with uh, planning schools chairs, for instance. Hence, we could not reflect on the processes of planning curricula and courses. We also don't know which specific pedagogical values and approaches are employed by the educators or planners for climate change adaptation. However, we can say something about the keywords hunted in the survey. Currently, I act as a researcher, lecturer, and practitioner, and I say that Climate change adaptation planning starts from the mandatory part of searching and understanding climate information and services. Adaptation planning can't be taught without this fundamental basis. In the survey, words like climate science or climate risk have been sought, of course, but more detailed and specific words may be employed and added into the planner's glossary. For instance, climate information, climate services, climate projection, prediction, forecasts, nowcast, early warning system. Concerning the climate information science, production and delivery, planners are also demanded to hunt for this information. Hence, I would also consider the adding of another keyword, such as climate brokering. Concerning the planning di dimension, I would consider the adding of other keywords, such as disaster risk reduction, also known as DRR, Disaster Risk Management, DRM, 
and contingency planning. It is important to educate planners in both ordinary and extraordinary planning processes. And in climate change adaptation, the two dimensions are strongly interlinked. I finish by saying that uh, planning schools have the important role in widening the scope of planners in the practice fields. Therefore, dedicated subjects to climate information production and delivery are fundamental when then the planner, planners will work in practice. First, because it's demanded by local policymakers. Second, because from what I see from my direct experience, we planners already have competitors with strong climate knowledge and uh, allow me to say it, zero knowledge on the decision-making, policy-making and urban regional planning sciences. I'm referring to research institutes and think tanks, think tanks whose focus is just, uh, whose focus are just the climate and meteorological disciplines. Well, I'm not against them, of course, but because they are very important to the climate change adaptation cause, but they are not professionally prepared for the plan making processes. So there is room for us. And there is, um, it's important to, to address these topics in the education curricula properly. This is my opinion. I finish by thanking all the organizers for a kind, kind invitation in this, uh, in this session. And uh, I lend uh, the word to Professor uh, Slusas. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, both of you, for your reflections on the survey. Um, I think it's interesting, interesting uh, to bring in some of the things which we were not perhaps directly covered in the in the survey. The the problems, maybe the limitations of um, some of the keywords which are there, and and of course the lack of being able to. Uh, go in depth into the various programs. Um, nevertheless, and also I think the needs, I mean, what Massimiliano was just referring to this, uh, the linkages to more broadly disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management. Um, and I think co the comparison of the ordinary planning with the extraordinary planning, although uh, maybe we can see, we can see already that, um, say uh, climate change is becoming more ordinary than uh, extraordinary in, in certain, certain circumstances. Uh, it certainly, we certainly see the signs of, uh, of change in the environment that, that, need, that require attention. I'd like to open the floor uh, for those of you who've been listening to, for any questions to anybody who's either about the survey itself or from the, the comments of Malia or Massimiliano. Someone has their hand up. Let me just see. Okay. Uh, Adriana. May yes. I, yeah, may I just add some comments? Yeah. Okay, I want to thank you both Malile and Massimiliano because they they have been uh, very they they had, they provided very interesting comments. But uh, I want to say that uh, obviously we consider this survey a first step. It is clear to us that uh, we should go more in depth uh, with uh, interviews uh, with the head of schools uh, and also with teachers uh, in order to better understand which are the real contents uh, in these programs, first of all. Second, I want to tell you that uh, this was a first step, uh, very important because uh, it's the first systematic uh, attempt uh, to have uh, a picture of uh, how much climate contents uh, are widespread in planning curricula in uh, Europe, because we had only some review for uh, UK, but uh, nothing for all over the Europe. Obviously, as Armando told us, uh, some, we, we do not have enough coverage uh, in some countries, but uh, it is uh, also truth that uh, some countries are not represented, represented enough uh, in ESOP uh, because, for example, in the case of Albania, we have only one school because only one school is a member of ESOP. So we decided to focus on uh, ESOP members. This is why some countries are less covered. covered. 
In any case, uh, for the point related to vulnerability, to disaster risk management, uh, you know uh, that our group is focused on uh, also disaster risk. So obviously we avoided some uh, keywords because some keywords like vulnerability are common uh, also to traditional risk management, uh, in a way, earthquakes. Uh, and uh, in some countries, uh, even in Greece or in Italy or even in Spain, some problems are uh, probably even more uh, relevant in respect to climate issues. So we wanted to better focus avoiding these words uh, on climate contents. But I agree with you that probably we, we should review our uh, set of uh, uh, keywords uh, and uh, we have to go on with this work uh, even though it is not very easy because it requires a lot of resources so it's not very easy to to go on with this okay i finished thanks adrian i think you you raised some good points there i mean this is an, indeed a, a first attempt to make a sort of european wide uh, survey to to and also enable a more global uh, comparison with what's happening in other regions of the world, which is actually the I say the main focus of uh, the thinkers urban thinkers campus anyway. To and to try to stimulate schools also to to I think to rethink what they're doing um, and encourage them to invest more, maybe give more attention to climate change issues. Because though you say that in some places um, maybe other types of hazards earthquakes or whatever tsunamis or might be more important i think none of us can deny that everyone is going to be affected by this in some manner or form um so it, it does have some sort of universal appeal although there will be differences of course contextual differences from place to place are there other people who i see one other cassidy you'd cassidy. like to yeah, I really appreciated the comments also uh, from Male and Massimiliano. Thank you so much for that. And I think that, yeah, I think the next, uh, this was a very sort of uh, small funded study. Uh, and I think, and we each put in, we all have all put in some time to this because we all believe, uh, don't we, that, that this is an important topic to look at. And I do think that the next step of this is certainly to understand uh you know how each what what is being taught around climate change and how that's integrated into the courses and i think that the qualitative work on that is is certainly the next step to understand you know what people are teaching and how they're teaching it and i also do uh my my feeling from looking at the data although what seems a low amount, you know, under 2% uh, being taught on climate change in most of the programs. I think that there is a very promising element uh, there on the, the presentation. And if I may just show that, that slide again, which is that, um, that out of the, uh, the programs that we looked at, I think there was 146, 91 programs had core content about climate change. So this is uh, more than half have something in the core content about climate change. And I think as you raise, uh, Malay, is that when you see something, probably more is being taught than, than what it appears on the internet, you know, that we, you know, we as uh, planners, most of us do think that climate change is an important topic and are integrating it more and more into our teaching. And, um, and that, and we also were interested in this aspect of mainstreaming. So how much is climate change being uh, mainstreamed across the programs. And this is when we see that 283 out of the 143 programs, 83 had two or more courses about climate change. This is, uh, this is starting to get at mainstreaming. I mean, it's very sort of early elements, but that's saying that, okay, climate change is being taught in at least two, uh, but the idea is that it should be taught almost in every course that somebody takes. And so, so I think this aspect of mainstreaming is a really important element to look at as we go forward into looking at qualitative work, which is how much is it being mainstreamed across the courses. Good, thanks, Cassidy. 
Are there other observations or points? Yes, I see Daniel. Daniel. Um, I was firstly a bit doubtful about the quantitative research design because I'm gen I generally am. But then I thought of if I were to looking for a study program as a student, as a after school, it's super important that these words pop up in the descriptions. It's not only about looking in depth and then everything's fine because we're all dealing with it. Mm. Yeah, that was it for now. I think I think this was one of our concerns also. If you sort of how difficult it is to actually find information yeah. in de in depth about what's going on without actually, you know, making appointments and contacting people. And um, it's not only in Europe. It's also I think an observation that was that we heard being made from the American schools and also in Australia that it's that we have all this internet and the possibilities to put out material. Um, it's it's often difficult to find the right stuff without actually contacting people directly, um, which is a, which means there's an opportunity there I think to to improve how we are promoting and selling what we what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was looking at our courses that we offer, and like there wasn't so much there, although they are directly addressing these issues. So yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe something this will come up again in the breakout groups uh, for sure. Okay, I think if I don't see any other hands at the moment, then maybe it's a good time. We can we we don't necessarily have to be here until five o'clock. I think if we go through the program and we have finished it, and or maybe we can reserve more time for the breakout groups or whatever, or for the next part. Let me move on um, because the next part of the program involves looking in detail more detail at a couple of programs. Um, so I'm going to hand over the microphone as moderator to Adriana, who's going to take yeah, care of this okay. part. I'm here. Okay, so first of all, I would like to know if uh, all the speakers are here, because I didn't see Professor uh, Claudia Cassatella. Is she with, with us? Massimiliano? Um. In a few minutes, she will appear. She will enter. Okay, we will start with. So Venice. better, uh, yeah. We start with Venice. Okay, we will start with. Venice. So, uh, this second session is uh, reserved to explore a little bit more in detail two innovative curricula on uh, planning for climate action offered uh, at two selected schools uh, in Italy. In particular, we invited uh, some representatives from two Italian universities, the University of uh, Venice, uh, IWAB, uh, UAB, and uh, the Politecnico of Turin, uh, which uh, according to our survey, offer uh, programs both at, uh, un at graduate and uh, undergraduate levels, uh, with a significant number of credits uh, devoted uh, to climate issues in both core and elective courses that, uh, as we mentioned before, is very important. And uh, I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have uh, Filippo Magni and Mattia Bertin for the University of Venice. Uh, both of them are uh, uh, for a very um, are engaged for long on research topics related to climate proof design and planning. And both of them teach in courses into their program recently established that is a graduate degree program in urban planning for transition that is directed by Professor Musco. And uh, it is also important to mention the fact that uh, the University of Venice and in particular Professor Musco established uh, uh, a planning and climate change laboratory acting uh, since 2011. So they have a long experience both in practice and in teaching. So I leave the floor to Filippo and Mattia. I don't know how they won't manage uh, this presentation. Asking for uh, Respect your time, you have 10 minutes uh, overall uh, to present uh, the course, uh, focusing in particular on some key aspects uh, that are, uh, first of all, when uh, you started uh, to introduce climate change related content uh, into planning programs. Uh, 
even before this new course on urban planning for transition. Then the second point is to understand that if uh, you were moved by a specific event, uh, there was a, an, a triggering event in uh, starting this kind of course, this kind of uh, redesign of planning curriculum. And then uh, in case, uh, if you encountered, uh, if you um, found specific barriers uh, in uh, redesigning uh, planning curricula according to climate issues. Finally, we would like to know uh, which kind of uh, knowledge and skills uh, your uh, program offer, if more theoretical contents, more practice-oriented contents, and so on. And uh, finally, very finally, uh, which are the feedback from your students uh, if they are involved uh, in curricula design, uh, if they, if you have already some feedback from them. Okay, Filippo or Mattia, are you there? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I will speak uh, uh, in the name of the both of us. We produced a presentation uh, that I think cover all the uh, question you mentioned before, and so I try to share it. And uh, if you can see it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, as you perfectly said before, climate change has an history in uh, University of Venice, and uh, everything more or less starts more than uh, ten years ago with uh, planning climate change lab. Uh, Planning Climate Change Lab is both dedicated to teaching, investigation, and supporting public of public administration in advocacy and consulting. Uh, the most uh, relevant themes we work on are climate change adaptation, of course, but also risk and vulnerability assessment, disaster risk reduction and recovery, circular economy, and maritime spatial planning. Uh, the evolution of uh, our experience in teaching started long before my presence and also Filippo's presence in uh, UF in uh, 2005 with uh, an official master program in environmental planning, uh, from which all the organization that we have today uh, started. In 2009, we had the first experience of a workshop called uh, uh, environmental planning studio. Then from uh, 2011 and to 2020, we added some courses dedicated to themes connected with climate change. The first was in 2011 at the starting of climate change, uh, planning climate change lab and was dedicated to climate change adaptation. Then we added in 2018 uh, as course on circular economy and one on post-disaster recovery. Um, and in 2020, we uh, decided to try to uh, put all the experience together, uh, branding a new official master in urban planning for transition, totally dedicated to uh, climate change planning, climate change related theme planning. Uh, we start, as I told, from uh, an environmental studio uh, dedicated to uh, help students in uh, developing wide area tools and rules for reducing the environmental impact of human life. But uh, in the years uh, and uh, in the increasing of uh, uh, climate change conscience, uh, uh, both uh, globally and in our, our work, we decided to uh, evolve it in a sustainability studio dedicated to uh, help students in uh, developing complex and interscalar planning of infrastructure with environment rules and economic models to support the integration of human life and ecological systems. So changing the mind, not just thinking about the impact of human life, but considering the relation between human life and economic ecological systems. Well, for this studio, we use a method uh, that we call OSAP method. The English translation is daring. 
and as a precise linear organization that starts from analysis based both on quantitative data, interviews, file visits, rules and plans, and want to help students in developing objective O with the, the identification of general goals, strategy S, uh, dedicated to the articulation of integrated process of actions and A actions, the minimal elements of, interven uh, of intervention for transformation. Aside of this, with the studio, we have the open course I mentioned before. Uh, from, as I told you, from 2021, we have a climate change adaptation uh, course. From 2018, we have a circular economy course. And from the same year, we have post-disaster recovery course. Every course has the same structure. A program with theory lessons, a series of uh, integrative seminars with international uh, scholars and uh, practice uh, experts uh, coming from uh, the private and uh, from the public administration and a practical pathway, pathway towards the exams that keep the students uh, to examine a case study uh, to apply the notions learned. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, and as uh, Adriana was uh, asking him her question, uh, we now have uh, a master degree completely dedicated uh, to uh, these, uh, these themes and is organized in, in two years. In the first year, we have a circular, stud, circular city studio that come from the circular uh, economy um, course, uh, a special planning for climate change uh, studio that keep together the course on uh, sustainability, uh, the studio on sustainability and the course of climate change adaptation, and some theoretical courses that you can see here in the, in the presentation I will share. In the second year, we have uh, the, her the uh, legacy of the disaster planning and post-disaster building course that became a disaster planning and post-disaster building studio. Uh, and a course dedicated to uh, maritime special planning, really relevant for us uh, studying in Venice, and some theoretical courses. We have a lot of international experience connected to climate change uh, uh, teaching that we uh, give as possibility to all our students. Some join master with Barcelona, Lisbona, Girona, and uh, the University of Sassari uh, in Alguero. Uh, Two, a possibility of double degrees, one with REM and one with uh, TUNGI. Uh, some uh, possible experience of uh, internship in some uh, European university as Madrid or Copenhagen, uh, and some with uh, public administration as, uh, for example, the one uh, every, every year uh, feasible, that is Washington DC, uh, and some workshop that we every year organize in Philadelphia, Marseille, uh, Kipro, Maldives, uh, Thessaloniki, and, and more. The results uh, have been in this year, 45 uh, new students uh, enrolled from uh, outside of Italy and 25 from Italy uh, that uh, enrolled, sorry for the repetition, uh, to the new master, doubling the number of enrolling students to the previous master. Uh, the core, all the courses uh, related to climate change have been really appreciated by the students. And for this reason, we decided to change the, um, uh, the, the dedication of our master degree. And uh, uh, we have a really interesting percentage of thesis dedicated uh, to related topic. Uh, we uh, can observe a nice success of students uh, after the, the degree in finding employment on related topics. Uh, I have to say that we don't have uh, so much problems or um, uh, constraints in the organization of this uh, experience that came as a normally a normal uh, evolution of uh, our uh, work as uh, scholars, as uh, supporting uh, to the public administration as, and as teaching. I don't know if uh, Filippo wants to add something more to the presentation we did together, or if you have other questions about what I just said. 
thank you, Mattia. Just a couple of uh, comments because you explain more or less uh, all what uh, Adriana asked to us. Uh, just a, uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, the Adriana asked uh, which kind of technical uh, aspect uh, the students um, learn from this type of courses. Uh, we try to um, provide them a very high technical uh, perspective of the how in which way we can address uh, the, the issue of climate change, uh, adaptation, mitigation, and disaster risk, risk reduction. So we try to uh, teach them in which way we can use the new technology and the instruments they can uh, are able to use uh, to support public administration and use in the everyday life uh, in terms of uh, learning and work uh, in an autonomous way and to try to find their way outside of the university. In the second way, we can underline that uh, after uh, five, uh, 10 years, we can say that in our personal research group that is planning and climate change uh, lab, we are uh, working together with almost 12 students that uh, start their path inside of our uh, master courses. So they understand the importance of the issue of climate change and they want to follow up this issue working inside of the research path. So we have uh, five PhD students. We have other um, three uh, students that uh, finish the master degree and apply for other international uh, PhD uh, pathway in other uh, universities. So for us, it's a very good result because we are trying to create a sort of uh, way of um, approaching the issue of climate change. So for us, it's a, a, an important result that start in the master and finish with the PhD and follow up with the research, uh, the real research life. So that's probably is one of the most important results in terms of teaching and legacy of this uh, career. Thank you very much, uh, Mattia and Filippo. I just want to ask some questions and then to leave the floor to others with uh, questions. And uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a, a master program. Do you have uh, any difficulties uh, with uh, the background of the students when they start your master? Because you offer some uh, basic knowledge on uh, climate science. I saw some courses, but uh, probably they come from uh, a background in which uh, this kind of topics uh, have been totally neglected. So if you have a difficulty in this sense, then uh, I, I, I would like to understand better if uh, you also provide uh, a very interdisciplinary approach, not only in terms of uh, which kind of basic knowledge of uh, uh, knowledge-based courses, but also in practice, in your studios, uh, in a way, if you use uh, an interdisciplinary approach, because we saw that this is a, a very important uh, point for uh, an effective uh, improvement of planners' capacity to cope with climate issues. Okay, I don't know uh, which question I want you to answer, Filippo. Probably um, the second. You okay, so to the first. Great. Well, yeah, we have problems. Uh, we have problems, but um, we had problems also before this master because we find uh, really diff different preparations in students uh, incoming. Uh, we accept uh, uh, students coming from different uh, backgrounds and faculties uh, and uh, uh, most of them uh, doesn't have a really uh, uh, territorial preparation. They normally come with a lot of uh, uh, knowledge and uh, uh, vision about questions related to climate change, climate impacts, and uh, uh, all these uh, aspects, but maybe more on a... Uh, uh, political vision, 
better than uh, a tutorial vision. We have normally to uh, work a lot on uh, uh, the physical dimensions and relations uh, uh, before to really start uh, working on the, on the themes we uh, want to we want to share with the master. So yeah, I have to say that. Uh, we, we found it as a problem and we uh, this debated a lot into the organization of the master if uh, uh, could be a solution to organize uh, um, a short really, uh, really, what's the word, uh, intensive uh, seminar or, or weeks of seminars uh, to prepare them, but uh, we don't have a solution until now. Hey, Filippo, what about the second point? Regarding the second point, um, we can say that uh, um, Mattia present a, an, an important slides where are listed all the courses. And because the master, the, the, the master that start this year um, is organizing two years master degree course that um, works around a very important um, studio planning studio for each semester that is the the primer um, the most important exam for each semester and we have uh, one studio for each semester so we have four main studio circularity adaptation and disaster risk, risk reduction and finally the, the the master thesis around of this uh, studio there are a lot of courses that uh, organized it before try to support in a different perspective the work of the studio so for example uh, around the issue of circularity there are a lot of um, frontal courses that try to uh, provide contents that support different perspective uh, around the circularity for example the uh, met urban metabolism in the second semester, for example, we have other courses that provide enough knowledges that uh, are uh, connected to the uh, adaptation and uh, spatial planning that can, that, can, that can help the students to understand uh, the 50 shadow of the adaptation that they need to apply in the territory and uh, that are useful for the studio. So we know that probably in a single semester, uh, the students are not able to understand everything and uh, to combine all the possible contents to support the, uh, the, the working that the works that they have to develop in the studio. But the organization of, of the semester is uh, um, organized to support this kind of work because we noticed that without enough preparation, not only in the specificity of uh, adaptation or climate change, they are not able to understand the different perspective that uh, the planning for adaptation, disaster risk reduction, mitigation, sustainability um, are not enough to uh, take the, um, the right decision to take uh, in enough um, consideration all the perspective that this that the issue uh, require for example the social dimension the economical dimension the normative dimension that can help the students to address their uh, operativity o of course uh, specifically oriented to adapt to provide some indication for the the future and or the city and the territory so we are this both combination frontal lesson that support uh, studio and uh, more laboratorial uh, activities. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, I see the hand uh, of Richard, uh, but uh, I would like to ask him, uh, since I received uh, a message from uh, Claudia Cassatella, uh, I would like to first present uh, Air Force uh, and then uh, we can go to the questions uh, because she told me that uh, she has to stop at uh, four o'clock. So she has to go oh. at four o'clock. So it is better to start with I'm that. so sorry and, because I came late and I'm going <laughs> away oh, uh, in, in advance. Oh, it's sorry. really, but this is life. <laughs> okay, I, sorry, I just introduce uh, Professor Cassatella. She is an associate professor at the Politecnico of Turin. And their research activities have been uh, for a very long time uh, focused on environmental issues. 
and uh, she's now responsible for the graduate program, uh, Territorial Urban, Environ Urban Environmental and Landscape Planning. That includes uh, several courses uh, focused also on climate change. So we would like to share with her uh, this experience uh, and uh, according to the questions I provided before and I mentioned it when uh, we started with Venice, so I do not repeat them. But the idea is to go a little bit through the history of the course, when you started, why you decided to include climate related contents, which are the barriers you encountered and which kind of knowledge you offer and which is the level of appreciation from the students. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, uh, space uh, for presenting our our engagement in uh, climate uh, change education. Um, Polytechnic University of Torino has a Master of Science in Territorial, Urban, Environmental, and Landscape uh, Planning since uh, many years, but we recently uh, opened a new curriculum in English language, um, which is called Planning for the Global Urban Agenda, and. Designing this uh, curriculum, which is uh, specifically addressed to international students, uh, we included uh, climate change uh, as a specific uh, uh, topic. Um, let's say that our, the focus of our master uh, already uh, was, uh, well, the master was already focused on uh, environmental sustainability on um, energy efficiency, for instance, uh, sustainable mobility, um, topics such as uh, land take and uh, similar issues. Uh, but um, we thought that uh, climate change uh, is a, um, a topic of uh, obviously um, interest uh, at the global uh, level and need for global policies, uh, solutions discussed at international level, so uh, perfectly matches uh, the, um, um, the aim of uh, our new uh, curriculum. Um, new disciplines. Well, actually, uh, we already had an interdisciplinary uh, a wide range of disciplines. Um, so the introduction of the disciplines was, was marginal. Uh, the key issue um, was to engage teachers uh, which pract who practice their discipline in a, let's say, climate sensitive approach. I mean, for instance, the planning, urban, it, it, it's urban planning, it's regional planning, but we try to engage those of us who are more engage in this topic. Uh, the same for uh, landscape ecology, for instance, or territorial hydrology, which were disciplines that we already had, or energy efficiency. Um, and I would like to share with you my concern about the fact that uh, probably increasing the number of different disciplines can contribute, of course, to the understanding of the phenomenon in many ways, but at the same time, um, to train planners, we have to focus on their specific skills. And so it's, um, uh, you know, in planning education, it's difficult to find an equilibrium between uh, the need for uh, an interdisciplinary approach and the need for uh, very specific skills. So um, we are, uh, Reflecting, reflecting on this point. In, in terms of uh, uh, specific knowledge, uh, the, um, the topics that are more used, um, more near to uh, the need for education uh, related to climate change are probably geomatics and remote sensing, energy challenges and environmental sustainability. These are the titles of, of uh, some of our uh, courses, obviously. Territorial hydrology, environmental assessment, landscape ecology, urban hydrology, and ecology. Here I am mixing uh, courses of the English curriculum and of the Italian curriculum because we we have both. Uh, but in particular, the, the um, 
climate change is addressed by the um, courses planning for environment and by the studios planning for climate change and landscape and territorial planning. Uh, here, we try to train students uh, on how to develop a, uh, specific policies and, uh, and planning tools for protecting the environment and to, uh, to deal with a, a range of planning solutions. Uh, so green infrastructure, so park planning, landscape planning, etc. And the studios are obviously um, exercises on real case study um, uh, led by a group of teachers, so led by, a, by an interdisciplinary team hmm? mm, in teamwork. Um, at the same time, we think that it's also relevant to give a, a theoretical framework um, uh, starting with the very basic concepts such as nature, environment, mm, before dealing with sustainability or resilience, uh, et cetera. Um, plus, uh, as, we, as we are noticing in these days of a political debate on climate change, uh, environmental justice uh, is a relevant topic and decision making. So uh, I, we think that our planners need to have specific skills on decision making and uh, uh, mediation of conflicts. Mm -hmm. So these are a uh, topic that we, had, that we deal with, uh, both in specific uh, part of the syllabus and by some pedago pedagogical approaches uh, and innovative uh, modules. Um, for instance, role games, <laughs> we play role games or uh, similar, um, or workshops, uh, or uh, tests such as the new ecological paradigm, because uh, again, uh, we have to manage this uh, topic uh, in an intercultural uh, environment. Uh, we have uh, 15 different nationalities and well, in Glasgow, I think that now today there are many, many more. And so this is a part of the training hmm, that we would like to provide in relation to climate change and environmental issues in general. Okay, so um, this is the end. We have, uh, uh, we enroll around the 60, 70 students uh, per year. Um, they are satisfied, uh, their performance, their job uh, performance uh, is uh, rather good, uh, mostly if compared with the Italian situation. Um, and if you like to have more information, uh, please uh, find us on the web or on Instagram and uh, in our yearbook, uh, you can uh, see examples uh, of the, of the um, works that our students um, do. Thanks for your attention. Thanks to you, Claudia. And uh, I want to first open the floor to discussion and give the floor to Richard that wanted to ask something. Uh, please, uh, I prefer to have first questions for Professor Castatella because she has to go and then we go on with uh, you up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, maybe I can pose a question which could be treated by both, but so Claudia could also respond. Um, I really enjoyed both presentations. I was, I was curious to know a little bit how the the, the content of the studios is is differs. You know how you build one studio upon another. Does it make a difference in which sequence you do things and how you uh, say keep it interesting for the students? Also by adding new perspectives and new skills, maybe new methodologies. Because, for example, in uh, well, you have these two studios in in Turin, the planning for climate change and the landscape and territorial planning. Mm -hmm. In what ways are they different? Does what is the sequence of these, and how does one build on the other? And a little bit also, I think in the in the Venice case, you are, there were four studios, and so these connections between them, I think, are interesting. It could be interesting to talk about. Okay, thanks. 
um, so I start. Um, Landscape Territorial Studio uh, is the studio of the Italian uh, group, of the Italian curriculum, which I carry on since, uh, well, I hold it since uh, 10 years now, maybe. And so let's say that uh, uh, it has a... Um, it has been recently colored <laughs> by climate change hmm? more and more um, with the with, um, landscape ecology and environmental assessment and but climate change is uh, just uh, um, an ingredient hmm? uh, climate change studio is the studio for the english group english language group i say um, and um, so it identifies since the beginning uh, a topic related uh, to climate change, usually at the, at the local level, hmm? with the contribution with contribution on uh, urban hydrology and urban ecology. Hmm. So the students do not uh, take both usually. Okay. Whereas uh, planning for environment is a, a course in the, the first semester at the, the at the very beginning of the first term term of the first year, and uh, provides uh, a conceptual framework and an overview of of tools of planning tools and solutions. Okay. And in the case of Venice, because you had, I think you mentioned four studios. <laughs> so um, this, no, no, no. No, in Venice, it was for oh, yeah. Yeah. Venice. <laughs> yeah, I, I mentioned that we had three studio and one final studio that it's very linked to the, the, the master thesis. So uh, the, the, the fourth probably is not a real studio, but is a sort of uh, work that uh, probably starting from the studio, um, reach the, the 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 level of the thesis, but for us, uh, we um, decide um, to try to have one specific issue or the perspective of the for each uh, studio. One is circular economy and urban metabolism. The second is the very uh, pure uh, spatial planning for adaptation to climate change. The third is uh, more concentrated in disaster risk reduction. So we have three different uh, issues that uh, are the theme that orient all the activity in the studio. Uh, for each studio, uh, probably completely uh, everything changed uh, in terms of scale of operation, in terms of uh, geographical location, the case studies, and probably the perspective that each teacher, that each professor provide to the students. The idea is to connect the three studio using the same, first of all, the same approach and the same idea to consider these three elements, the, these three issues, uh, three important, uh, um, how can I say, elements that the student needs to consider in the contemporary uh, planning issues because the entire master course have a specificity uh, or a specific orientation um, and that, that of course have to consider other dynamics like economical dynamics, social dynamics, but try to look the world with this perspective. I uh, thank that Adriana before um, make a reference to the, the COP20 the cup of Glasgow, because in this moment, specifically, all the world tried to look of this issue. But probably at the end of the COP, everybody forget that there is an issue that globally uh, count. We try to uh, take the student focus on this specific issue that uh, for one studio, take the, the, the skin uh, or the, um, the appears of uh, urban metabolism with a specific declination, et cetera, for another semester is the uh, adaptation to climate change, decline in co urban context, uh, agricultural context, and so on. And the third one that uh, try to connect the disaster risk, risk reduction in all the perspective of the territory. So we, this is our idea of uh, take this issue and orient all the activity around that. Thank you, Mattia. I would like to know if other questions uh, come from uh, the participants. 
Yes, there is one. Cassidy has a hand up. Cassidy? My, uh, yeah, I have my hand up, Adriana, I think. Anyway, um, yes, I just had a question about, uh, Claudia, you mentioned around trying to get the uh, the tutors to to think about the content of what they're teaching uh, in terms of the development goals and and I was wondering if I mean it just led me to start thinking about this idea of uh, mainstreaming climate change education into planning and what that really means because um, I guess it would mean that every lecturer would need to think about what they're teaching and how uh, climate change, putting a climate change lens on that. And I'm just wondering if either of you had had, had any experience with that. I mean, I, I know like in my department, we were asked by the university uh, to, for example, to review all our programs in terms of diversity. So, you know, decolonizing the curriculum uh, and I guess it would have to be the same kind of thing of that. I don't know if you've had any experience with those kind of things or not. Yeah. And uh, our uh, Polytechnic of Torino asked us to identify the sustainable development goals that match our uh, syllabus. Mm. So, okay. So uh, in our syllabus, we also mm, check the list uh, of yeah. the goals and okay. with it. Um, mm. So this is... Uh, one yeah. aspect but um, yeah. um of course uh, i think that um we need the uh, instructors uh, that are aware and and more than, than aware so and yeah. so we it's many, sometimes it's not needed to have uh, an a really an expert uh, in a different discipline but just the right person. This is my 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 experience, at least in my, in our department. Mm -hmm. Not all the planners are, are so sensitive or interested in in developing this this uh, this issue. Mm -hmm. And so, this is my what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Claudia. It's very difficult. This is true both for. Uh, climate issues and for traditional risks. Uh, because if you look at uh, the different programs, it largely, the, the contents largely depends on the, um, how can I say, awareness and interest of a teacher, unfortunately. And uh, we still have a barrier because uh, a lot of planners uh, are not really sensitive to these issues. Okay, other questions from uh, people? Uh... No, I don't think there, so. There is maybe one, the, one of the questions you asked, Adriana, was whether there was a sort of event or a, what was the trigger? A uh, triggering event. Yeah, and I, I know that Venice has regular flooding. That's, that's clear. Um, was that was that an issue or not? And and maybe maybe there are other things that are happening that we that maybe we are not generally aware of. Well, I think that we are weakly triggered by events in Venice, but I can't think about a precise event that happened this uh, in, in this uh, in this path. Uh, I can say per personally, I have, but not as uh, not as group, or uh, maybe Filippo. I don't know if you agree. I, I think that, of course, uh, Venice is a peculiar environment, uh, probably unique in the world, even if, if every country have the specific Venice of blah, blah, blah. But uh, our Venice is the original ones and we suffer the original flooding. So we have something that other Venice in the world doesn't have. But I think that we follow more or less the global impact of the, uh, the, the, the climate change. Uh, I probably remember, um, personally, I think that the, the trigger was uh, linked strongly with the Sandy Hurricane, because probably in that period uh, was the, mm, the global perspective was uh, ready to understand the real uh, weight of the uh, impact of climate change. And in that period, exactly, we start uh, discussing with the University of Philadelphia uh, to try to have a combination of uh, a common agreement to try to teach to the students a common approach 
for one side of the, uh, the ocean and the other. So um, I think that for our group, probably was not the trigger, but the trigger was a global trigger that uh, allow us to follow more or less the leader that say, okay, climate change is a very global and important issue, even for uh, the academic perspective. So, and for, thanks to that, uh, I, I don't want to, do, to say thanks to the Hurricane Sandy, but thanks to these events and the consequence of these events, everybody starts to take the, the, a different point of view of the, of the, of the issue. So probably uh, we are part of the system and we follow that turning point. Okay, I think that Claudia is to go. And saying goodbye. Thank you for this opportunity of debate. I hope that we will have uh, new ones. So good, good, good. Yeah, good probably we will continue during uh, the ESOP Congress uh, because we want to enlarge this discussion uh, to, mm -hmm. for example, other experience, both in the, in the Netherlands and uh, in uh, Ireland, for example. Perfect. So probably we will invite you to share your experience during the next ESOP Congress. Possible. Okay, mm -hmm. I think we can close this uh, session and I don't know if Richard want to give a break or we go. We want to go on with uh, the breakout groups. Um, I'm not sure. I th I th well, we, we plan to just continue. I know that uh, may maybe we should just continue and get started and, and see how it goes. And in the course of the breakouts, maybe people can still run away for a few minutes if they need to if they need to uh, grab a coffee or something. Um, I see the numbers have dropped a little bit. We're down to 15 people, but I, but we have, the idea was now to split into some breakout groups. So I'll just give them the mic to Dan, Daniel. He okay. was going to organize this part. Yeah, hi. Um, so I will present you the four topics for breakout sessions that we prepared. The first one will be barriers to increasing climate change education and knowledge gaps. Um, barriers could be of the institutional type or organizational or motivational. The naming of barriers is important even more is how to address them. So knowledge gaps could be inspired by good practices you came across in this conference, this session or somewhere else. This breakout group will be moderated by Adriana if I'm correct. The next breakout group will be moderated by Cassidy and is concerned with opportunities for increasing planning's role in climate action. So that could be, I don't know, empowerment strategies for or with students, change in self-construction of future planners, etc. Loosely connected to that, the next group, which I will moder moderate, is dedicated to innovative pedagogical approaches. And I'm sure there are ideas flying around in your head, such as challenge-based learning, collaborative methods, maybe also talking about Hutton Trost's notion of resonance or real world laboratories. And last but not least, moderated by Richard is, the topic is towards a core set of knowledge and skills on planning for climate action. So what should the curriculum look like or what could the curriculum look like? What do you think should necessarily be part of planning education now? And these questions can also be, or should also be linked to accreditation requirements for professionals. Etc. So with that, like, uh, am I, can I, yeah, I can share my screen. So I show you an overview. Oh, do you see it? No. Like yeah, that. Of the four, of the four groups. And I suggest that you write uh, your names in the, in the chat here, and then I will well, actually, I, assigned, I people, or do you do you take care of assigning? People can people? join a breakout room they want to. I think. Ah, okay, okay, okay. You can just there's a breakout room. But if you gave if you gave the rights to them, that's perfectly fine. That's even better. And so we have, um, I think, thirty minutes reserved for the breakout sessions, and afterwards we will come together again and share the findings of each group. Yeah. So. If you open the breakout room box, you can see, see at the bottom, you will see, uh, well, you, you can choose which one you want to join. So we, we have until, what was it? 4.35, I think. But, yeah, 
1635 or so. Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat, Richard, uh, where they have to... Um... On, on the bottom of the screen, of your screen, you'll see a, uh, a, a, an icon called breakout rooms. And if you click on that, you'll get a list, a drop-down list, and you can just move to the, the room. You can just join one room. Maybe you have to click on the three dots where more with more, if it doesn't immediately show. But here on Zoom, no? In Zoom, yeah. In the lower black row of symbols. Yeah. I, ah, okay. If, if I join my room, then I won't be able to communicate with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Can you find? Can you see it, Adriana? No. Okay, I wait. just see the screen of uh, Daniel and uh, your. Uh... Oh, maybe that, well, that it could be on another maybe, window. Maybe, maybe Daniel, you can stop sharing. Okay. If you go to breakout rooms. Yeah. Down at the bottom. Adriana, perhaps it's written as sessioni secondarie. Exactly. It's nearby reazioni. Okay, okay, okay. sessioni secondarie. So it. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Then see you all later. Let's see how many people are still oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> I know all of you already from the breakout room. And one well, day, how many people are yeah, they're coming back? And it's not very democratic shutting down breakout rooms like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Richard, I did uh, something strange, so I do not have any more uh, the our uh, thoughts on the on the Jamboard, I'm trying to recover it, but I don't know how. Okay. Adriana, I have it. So if you want, I can share my screen. Ah, perfect. Thank you very much. Very good. I told them that I was not very confident with this. <laughs> That's all right. It was our learning process. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So So I don't know how do you want to proceed if uh, each of us has to discuss the barriers and uh, no, the, the, the tools. That we I think we should just like you present what you found out in your breakout group and then maybe like there are only two breakout groups in total and then the others could somehow add to it and then we do it the other way around. Okay, we had uh, some participants, Deepa and uh, Malile and Filippo and Mattia. And we discussed a little bit because it, it was a very short discussion. Uh, and the main barriers uh, was, uh, we, we recognized that was the a sort of uh, unprepared and uh, not very aware of the problem teaching staff. So it is uh, probably important, first of all, to improve uh, the awareness of teaching staff and also provide them with uh, some tools for uh, improving uh, climate contents uh, in their courses. Mm -hmm. Another point is uh, the unequal perception of the priorities uh, because not everybody uh, really understand uh, that climate change is uh, a priority that uh, should be um, discussed uh, or introduced uh, in uh, all the courses and uh, in all the uh, disciplines related to planning. And uh, it is still true that climate is uh, uh, addressed as a separate issue. Uh, 
this is also a question related to the demand uh, from uh, these capacities uh, in planning uh, uh, competencies or in planning schools, because uh, in many countries, uh, um, traditional planning tools uh, are still uh, very far from uh, being uh, climate sensitive. Uh, so in many cases, the demand from this kind of competencies uh, comes from, uh, uh, mentioned from the guys from Venice, uh, uh, from uh, large cities uh, uh, involved in uh, climate adaptation plans or strategic plans focused on uh, these issues, but not from uh, traditional planning tools. And then obviously these are also knowledge gaps because the unprepared teaching staff is also a problem of knowledge gaps that we should address. And in many curricula, there is still a lack of basic knowledge about climate science. And again, a lack of a holistic approach looking at climate issues in all the type of knowledge we provide to planners, to future planners. And we also mentioned the topic of interdisciplinarity because in many cases, for example, also, for example, also when we talk about uh, migrations, uh, we should consider that migration is uh, very uh, often uh, uh, due to climate, uh, uh, to climate change. And so we should, uh, consider these aspects uh, also from an anthropological or a sociological point of view. These are the, ba the basic uh, thoughts. Uh, we, if the, the others want to, sh to share some uh, other ideas, uh, I don't know. Thank you, Adriana. Please, if anyone. I think you can also speak directly without raising your hands. No, I don't think that they want to share something, uh, other uh, points. So thank you, Filippo. I was, I was, I was just wondering, Adrian, did, did you talk at all about issues related to accreditation? You know, it was mentioned last week that there are sort of sort of some bureauc bureaucratic issues which maybe interfere with making changes in programs. No, we didn't uh, address this topic. We discussed only from for the point that, uh, for example, in Italy, we have a very old uh, um, planning law. Uh, so it's in many cases, uh, the competences on climate issues is not requested uh, from uh, in a way the traditional planning system. Mm. I don't know how is that how is that in the, in the the Netherlands, Richard? Because as far as I know, also Germany, it's just not a thing. Yeah, well, in the in the Netherlands, there's actually uh, there's there's not really a, like a professional accreditation body for planning that says this is what a planner okay. is, you know. So we, but of course, all the planning courses are accredited by the um, the Dutch Flemish uh, academic uh, accreditation organization. Um, and they look at, and they have sort of descriptions of what what planners should know in general. Um, but it's it's very much, yeah. So it's 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 not written down, I think, very specifically in one place, like like happens in the UK or in some other countries. In Germany, often it's very technical that you have this energy efficiency consultant that you can do some courses on, and then you can put it on your on your on your label as a label and your on your CV and on your card and your business card. Yeah, yeah. But to my knowledge, at least, there's no there's nothing like a like a continuing professional education requirement or anything. So once you've graduated, <laughs> you you can more or less. Uh, mm -hmm work indefinitely apparently although of course most most uh, professional organizations or local governments will have training programs and encourage staff to of course to to update themselves yeah. what i maybe uh, could ask uh, adriana or your group is uh, you mentioned this 
the need for a holistic approach no in one of your sticky notes what do you mean with that do you mean with that that holistic in the sense of that climate emergency should be across all the all the different disciplines or all the topics or issues that are tackled or in the sense of that uh, in dealing with the climate emergency all the other issues should also be taken into account so i don't know if that is clear what i mean yeah filippo do you want to because i think that you mentioned it, the, the point yeah my point was uh, related to the idea that today and um, actually we uh, still um, considering the issue of climate change and in terms of teaching approach that it's linked to the, the volunteer of some teacher that look the perspective in a very specific way. But uh, combined with the other aspect that Adriana mentioned before, that is uh, the unpreparedness of some uh, professors and uh, scholars about the issue, um, we are not able to provide the right way to communicate the issue in some, in some specific, for some specific reason. Probably we are still linked to the, the initial perspective of, of climate change. I uh, already underlined in my uh, activity of research and communication that we cannot uh, follow the same narrative of the narrative that uh, uh, count the climate change uh, 20 years ago. Uh, because 20 years ago, the first image was very powerful, the idea of polar bear inside of the iceberg, and we still uh, looking and thinking of climate change um, strongly connected with this kind of image, but today uh, we um, we have we spend too much time uh, linking the idea of climate change in our everyday life. So we need to to broke with, um, with this uh, ancient image of uh, climate change, adaptation, resilience, um, translating them in a sort of new um idea of mainstreaming of all the uh, activity of spatial planning because uh, some students understand the the urgency of to act uh, to adapt the territory to provide a new way of uh, uh, plan the territory and the cities but they understand the um the small flexibility of uh, planning tools uh, the the I can I say the blindness of the, the urban policies that doesn't consider this issue like a relevant issue that are able to be connected with others. Uh, Adriana before mentioned the aspect of migration, but we, we can link with, uh, for example, the energy policies or the uh, building codes or some uh, technology, the architecture technology that still uh, doesn't consider the aspect of climate change very relevant to modify the old approach of how uh, building design, uh, architectural design, and so on. So this idea is to try to look at the problem, not sectorially, but try to understand with, the, with our colleague in which way we can count the same story with, an, with a new narrative that are able to consider the problem in a very different way. For example, if, if I may add something, uh, uh, we discussed also uh, about the landscape planning. And uh, in Italy, it has a very strong tradition and we have also some important uh, landscape plans, but uh, very few of them are really um, aware of the impact of climate uh, on uh, the change of landscape and on the landscape transformation. So when we talk about uh, landscape planning, uh, we, we should uh, try to understand uh, which are uh, also the impacts, uh, not in terms of uh, events, flooding and so on, but long-term events in terms of landscape transformation that climate uh, may provide. I, I, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. Because for those of you who are sort of like Felipe and so teaching different courses already for some years, I mean, the sense of urgency, I think, is really important to sort of try to stress without without becoming pessimistic. And this yeah. is the challenge, right? I think because 
it's it's very how was that it's too late for pessimism yeah yeah i i like i really like that i mean that's what i mentioned last week um that irrespective you know, it's one of the things that we were talking about also in our group i think was was agency yeah? that that we 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 all have uh powers within us to 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 change our own individual behavior but also to change our collective behavior um and it's about maybe looking for the opportunities to the points where we can actually leverage and start to make some difference and not be constrained overly constrained by the current structures or the current um uh you say blindness i think was the word that philippe was mentioned among amongst our colleagues maybe in some cases i'm i'm, I'm happy to say i don't think i have any colleagues <laughs> like that but but maybe others do um but there's also sort of the structures but broadly in society but also within the maybe the accreditation systems even which which tend to uh, prevent rapid change maybe daniel we should talk about what well, maybe some yeah. of the things we were discussing i mean these are all pre prelim quite preliminary discussions anyway of course yeah um still can i Oh, yeah, I can share my screen, I think, because I've got it as well. So. Right, it's shared already. Yeah, okay. So we, 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 I'm not sure if we did this in exactly the same way. I, I get a sense that we may not have. We just sort of had a bit of a brainstorm and everybody who was there was throwing their um, little sheets onto the, onto the big jam board. Um, at the top, we see this this little sign, agency matters, which was just what I was just referring to. The fact that planning as as a as a field is is all about acting um, and trying to trying to engage citizens, uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, governments, private sector uh, companies, whatever, in in a sort of uh, collective action on, to some extent. Um, and, and around this topic of climate action, I think we, we start to see signs that this is happening in some places more than others. Um, and, and, and we try to identify and distinguish between certain things which are knowledge based, skills based and, and maybe some more pedagogical uh, issues. We, I, th and I think it was interesting also, although we didn't speak about it here in, in our breakout group explicitly, but for me, at least it was, it was very interesting to look at the detail details of those discussions of from terrain and Venice, I think, because the, those are the sort of both programs have quite a number of topics that are very important. Um, and we, we, we did mention also this ecological landscape approaches, um, systems thinking and complexity, the importance of looking giving attention to inequalities and vulnerabilities um, and ha having some basic understanding of so fundamentals of climate science but also political decision making and political education and finance which is a, a, a very important one because of course what i think what what we have to what we try need to do if we're coming up with plans is they need to be uh, they need to be financed because every plan we make is going to require funding of some sort and how to connect or, or connect into uh, the programs and that, that there are there for to provide finance for climate change. Um, and there were a number of things maybe on the skill side, things related to conflict resolution, because we do see that there is a lot of um, well, there's a lot of wickedness in uh, in 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 relation to climate change issues, and so there will be conflicts for sure. So, how, but how to do integrated transdisciplinary planning? How to engage with all different types of groups effectively uh, should be should be part and parcel of the education process. Um, so, related to that is sort of looking for okay, finding room for for maneuver is also a little bit related to this issue of climate uh, conflict resolution, uh, engaging with people, etc. And around the pedagogy, pedagogical approaches, 
Um, what strikes me always, and what I think that's what I like about planning is the attention to studio work and actual doing, you know, getting students engaged in, in uh, coming up with plans, present, working out their ideas, elaborating those and communicating them. Um, there are some, quite some, uh, so the studio work component, I think is really, is really important in, in good education, good planning education. There are opportunities that we see certainly in my university, but in others also to uh, adopt challenge-based challenge learning approaches where we try to link, you could link a studio, for example, to a project that, um, or a specific topic that, uh, that the local municipality is confronted with or a particular community is confronted with. And you try to work with the students in that particular environment and get so that the problem is actually owned by somebody locally and that by locally may not necessarily mean the, the own local, say the, the, the government where you are actually based as a university, but it could be also at a distance these days. Um, and it's that engagement re with reality. And I think working closely with students and, and the in close interaction with students and teachers in this sort of studio project, challenge-based learning environments is really important. Daniel, you mentioned this resonance pedagogy but i'm not sure what that is maybe you want well it's actually it's about engagement because like it starts with this um theory of hadmut also that we live in this always uh, increasingly faster developing world and that people are super detached from their surroundings and from the world and his uh he proposes this concept, introduced this concept of resonance, and that's what we are actually looking for in the world. And then there is this trend of how that can play out in pedagogy, and that is very much connected to what I talked about in the in the and what you also mentioned with um, the agency matters and how have people engage with their world and feel empowered to change it. So it's about that. Yeah. Okay, maybe I should just leave it there. Uh, if other yeah. people would like to comment or ask questions, feel free. I think it's a little bit late and a lot of people is going. Yeah, some people are leaving. Also, yeah. Matia yeah. told us that he had to leave. Yeah. Should I, should I just round off then maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, first, first, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, of course, on behalf of the team to for those who have participated today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. And I, I think I certainly got something out of your contributions. I would like to just um, point out a couple of things. Firstly, uh, if you have made a presentation today, uh, and also for the Jamboards, it would, I would like to have copies of those materials, if possible, and I can make them available. Uh, via the, the website for the Urban Thinkers Campus. Um, and uh, so that's the first, the first thing. Uh, second thing is um, I will try to, in the, in the coming days, uh, see if I can come up with something like a, a sort of summary of what we have discussed and some key issues. I, will sh I think I can share it with you uh, before the, the plenary session on the 16th of where all the different regional groups uh, discussions will come, will be shared uh, and discussed again. Um, so I welcome any comments and suggestions on that as I, as it, I start to assemble that. Uh, and please try to join that session if you can, and if, if not, uh, and also encourage other people to join it as well. Especially if you live by the, th the people who think it's not important, maybe, <laughs> as well as those who are engaged. Um, I what what's going to happen after the after all of this? Uh, Adriana mentioned already that we are thinking of having some follow up follow up activity at the next ISOP Congress, which will be next year already. There is also a World Planning School Congress Congress is planned uh, for next year as well. It'll be in Bali. Probably it may or may not be a, a hybrid thing. I don't know, but in any case. There will be, I think, continuing discussions within the World Planning Schools Congress uh, related to this topic, of course. Uh, at least I, I expect there will be. 
Um, and I would encourage you, if you haven't already looked at it, I think one of the things that we'd like to do, well, that's important for this uh, Urban Thinkers Campus is that we, to share our experiences a bit more um, with a wider uh, spatial planning community, because a lot of what we're doing in Europe is not, is not only about Europe, it's also about other countries. Many, many schools can, uh, and lecturers at schools who have perhaps less resources can benefit from what we are doing. Um, so one of the ways to do that is through the Planners for Climate Action uh, Network. If you do not know what it is, you can find a link to it on the Urban Thinkers Campus website under the organi partner organizations, I think. Um, and there, that they, the, the, there's, there are two groups in that um, Planners for Climate Action organization. One is more about research, one on education, and they're trying to assemble syllabi from planning courses describing um, what's got what yeah more well, just describing what's going on in planning education related to this topic so if you can put materials there and uh, describing what you are doing uh, it can be very useful I think for others as well as perhaps for yourself uh, also in attracting new students perhaps or, or establishing new connections one other thing that struck me very much with the with the presentations both from uh, Venice and from uh, Turin are the number of collaborations uh, with partner universities within Europe but also outside of Europe and I think these are these collaborations are something that are extremely important for for everybody involved we will try to organize also a thematic group meeting of the Res resilience and risks mitigation strategies group probably early next year, because this year the, the time has almost run out and December is too busy for everybody, but I tried to organize something in January where we may follow up and see where we are with this, with all of these things going on. I would invite you to participate in that also. Uh, we're looking for some, we're always looking for new blood and people who can come up with new ideas and take, uh, take over also some responsibilities maybe from, from uh, some of us but just to enrich the discussion and keep it alive, I think. And one thing that popped into my head as we were talking, I don't know if there is still a cost action uh, funding program within Europe, but maybe it might be worthwhile to think about trying to establish some, some sort of cost action project or something to, to, in, to drive forward a little bit more uh, the developments around uh, teaching on climate change. With that, I'd like to close off. Um, thanks every, again, everybody for being involved. And uh, I will share as soon as possible some notes that uh, I will try to present next week at the closing plenary. Yeah, and I will put the film, the video will be put on the website as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Thank Love you very you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.